I hereby call the uh, Tuesday, July 19, 2022 school committee meeting to order it being six o'clock. I would ask that we please stand and salute the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. We do have a full agenda tonight. I will uh, call the roll just to establish a quorum. Mr. Sullivan? Here. Mr. Homer? Here. Mrs. Ehlers? Here. Mrs. Rivas Mendez? Here. Mr. Rodriguez? Here. Ms. Azak? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. And the chair is here as well. We have established a quorum. I do want to say that um, we are here tonight proudly joined by Deputy Superintendent Sharon Walder. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent, for being here. Mike Thomas is uh, away on a family, well-deserved family vacation. So thank you again for being here. Um, we will um, go into the, uh, into the agenda item. I will ask that when we, um, I will ask to take uh, Dr. Rick Herman, who's here tonight, our COVID uh, expert, to, to take him out of order. I know he has something else to go to as well tonight, so if there's no objections. But with that being said, uh, we will uh, go on to agenda two, which is the hearing of visitors. And Mrs. Campbell has indicated there are no hearing of visitors that have signed in. So thus, we will move on right now to agenda three. <coughs> Uh, at this time, it's the consent agenda, A, B, C, and D. Uh, are there any uh, matters that should be taken out or would we take them collectively? What's the will of the committee, please? Any matters taking out? Motion to accept as written items A, B, C, and D. Second. second. Motion was made by uh, Mr. Sullivan. It was kind of jointly seconded by Ms. Azak and Mrs. Sullivan. Before we take the vote, let me just read those into the record if I could. A is the approval of the minutes for the June 28, 2022 Special School Committee meeting. B is the approval of the minutes for June 21st, 2022 Regular School Committee meeting. And then C is request <coughs> for authorizations to submit proposals and expenditures of funds. One is the trauma-informed services and school grants from SAMHSA in the amount of $970,000 even. And two is the Perkins Equipment and Program Improvement Grant from DESE, D-E-S-E, and that's in the total amount of $35,000 even. D is the acceptance of notification personnel actions, leaves of absences, resignations, and retirements. We have a motion that was duly uh, seconded. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. It does pass unanimously. Uh, and we actually do not need to take Dr. Herman out of order because he's there on the agenda. So uh, number four is the report of Superintendent of Schools, Mike Thomas. Uh, a is the learning and teaching. And uh, now is the time to hear from Dr. Richard Herman, uh, pandemic consultant. Dr. Herman. Good evening, Rick. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, the first time I came before you was uh, two years ago, this, about in the summer, two years ago. I, I never thought I would be here two years later talking about the, uh, about the same thing. So. Today is pandemic day number 858, uh, which is uh, the 858th day since our first case of COVID, which was on March 14, 2020. And just to kind of put this all in perspective and tee it up, just so you can kind of have the historical background, this is what COVID has looked like in uh, the city of Brockton back from that first case through the uh, Delta wave and through the huge Omicron spike. And uh, now, the uh, BA5 uh, variant uh, affecting uh, most of the Commonwealth. Uh, just in terms of the numbers, for those of you who happen to follow this very carefully, uh, some of the numbers and percentages have changed. And the reason they've changed is uh, last week, or a couple of weeks ago actually, the state announced that it was using new census data for all of the municipalities for calculating its COVID uh, percentages and so the city of Bra even though the official data is not going to be released they feel until 2023 uh, the Donahue Institute uh, the, the uh, Department of Public Health partners with at UMass uh, took some of that data and recalculated what they think is the percentage uh, what the population of Brockton and is using this new population of 105,000 plus and so that and all of the going forward and all the data that I uh, publish on the uh, city website is based on this new uh, census data so where are we now that we've uh, kind of come two years into this thing this is uh, just a, big, a breakdown by age group of which uh, decade of life uh, everyone, uh, every case so far of the 30, 
thousand plus cases if you prefer to look at it in terms of absolute numbers. Uh, these are the absolute numbers uh, as of today uh, of uh, residents of the city who have uh, tested positive with a PCR test. So talking about a PCR test, and the uh, last time I was here, uh, and all the previous times I was here, it was pretty easy to come up with some pretty accurate data for you. Now it's not so easy anymore. And the reason it's not so easy anymore is because most of us are not doing PCR tests. Most of us have, uh, uh, if we have symptoms or uh, testing before a get-together, are now doing home antigen testing. These home antigen tests, if they test positive, are not reportable to the Board of Health or to the Department of Public Health. And so we really don't know how many cases there are out there. So we have to use some other data to look at and get a general idea of what the trends are. So we do look at case counts. We look at PCR case counts. And we look at percent, of, uh, percent positivity as a general indicator of how much COVID is out there. But what we're really focusing on now and what the um, uh, CDC is also focusing on is the severity of illness. So this is measured more in terms of hospitalizations and deaths. And we know that the vaccines are not horribly good about preventing illness. We still test positive even after getting shots and booster shots and a second booster shots. But we do do a pretty good job of keeping out of the hospital and out of the ICU if we've been vaccinated and double vaccinated. Uh, and so uh, we do look at uh, hospitalizations and deaths as an indicator of the severity of illness. We're also now relying a lot more on wastewater measurement. Wastewater measurement is actually looking at a sewer sample, uh, measuring the RNA of the COVID virus. Uh, and bit by measuring this, uh, it's uh, easy to tell whether the cases are generally going up or generally going down. Now, there's still a new science to this, and we don't have it all down pat. But uh, in general, we'll go over what the, what the wastewater data for Brockton uh, shows in just a sec. This is how we me used to measure it. So if you can remember back in the olden days, if you put in the time machine, uh, this was the, what the Desi's uh, red, yellow, green numbers were. And anything greater than eight, uh, we go remote in the school system. Well, that's wishful thinking. I mean, we haven't been less than eight ever. Uh, and so. Uh, uh, we don't use these uh, metrics anymore. We uh, went on to a new set of metrics to the Department of Public Health, basically looking at case counts, case counts and percent positivity, and measured based on the size of your community, the amount of cases there were, the percent positivity. This is the uh, Department of Public Health red, yellow, green color coding system that we still post on the dashboard. But now we're relying a little bit more on the CDC's color coding system, which looks at severity of illness. So this is really looking at the number of hospitalizations, and it's really countywide, but in Brockton, because we have two hospitals and can get that data readily, we rely and look at the uh, uh, data from the two hospitals in the city. So it's the amount of new hospitalizations, as well as how many people are actually sitting in the hospital right now. And that gives us a little bit better idea of the severity of COVID that's out there. And as I've said before, if COVID were just a bad cold and everybody just got some sniffles, we wouldn't care too much about it. But the fact is that people do end up in the hospital, they end up in the ICU, and they end up dying. So therefore, it is a concern. This is what the new weekly dashboard looks like. So uh, starting in July, Department of Public Health switched from daily reporting of data to weekly reporting of data. We are still able to retrieve data from the MAVEN, from the Massachusetts Epide Epidemiologic Network. We can still get it, but the state releases the data uh, on a weekly basis now. So just to take a closer look at what the dashboard shows, so if you do look at it, and I know you're gonna be looking at it every week, the, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health color coding system, which looks at case count and percentage positivity, that's in the lower right-hand corner there. And the CDC metrics uh, are up in the upper uh, area there, which look more at uh, uh, number of hospitalizations and the percentage of beds occupied by COVID patients. So this is COVID from the beginning of the pandemic, just to kind of give you an idea of where we are. Uh, the most recent, and this is the, the trend line is a seven day trend line. So the orange line is a, an, a, an, a seven day average. And so this tells us that now we're kind of in the low 20s 
Well, I don't believe it for a minute. So it really depends on which modeling system you look at. The kind of the best modeling system, I think, is through George Washington University and says that really the case count we're looking at probably might be about seven times underestimating. So instead of 21 cases, it might be closer to 140 cases that we're seeing in Brockton. And we all kind of get that sense of, well, I know somebody with COVID, or I had COVID, or I, it's out there. And uh, it doesn't feel like it's a 20, it feels like it's more like an 100. And so we don't know the actual number because people are not testing or they're testing with home testing, and that's not reported to the Department of Public Health. This is what we do measure as the active number of cases. So these are folks that have tested positive through PCR testing and are now in a 10-day isolation period, and we feel that there's 245 of them. But again, this underestimates how many really are in isolation right now. So it might be closer to 1,000 uh, residents right now that, that uh, are actively isolating because of COVID. So this is the wastewater sampling that I was talking about. So the wastewater, take a sample from uh, on a given day, uh, measure the RNA, and there's a way of kind of calibrating that measurement so you can kind of make sure that it's accurate. This is the MWRA wastewater. This is the, the area south of Boston. So regionally, we should be something similar to this. This does not include Brockton. It's just a couple of towns north of us, as you can see. Uh, but we do measure the wastewater in Brockton. And this is what the wastewater signal, as they call it, the wastewater signal shows, uh, with the most recent uh, data point being on the 14th of July. So uh, there's a little bit of a lag, and you don't get it right away. You have to wait a few days for a specimen to come back from the lab. But as you can see, over the last week, it's kind of a jumble, uh, a little bit of a mishmash, and not quite sure which way that arrow wants to go. Uh, it does look like it's trend ha has trended up, but quite honestly, we're not sure why that happens, uh, because sometimes if there is a cluster, a big outbreak, like for example this week, uh, homeless shelter, big outbreak, uh, treatment center, big outbreak. Uh, and so because of that, uh, it might cause the wastewater signal to bump up on any given day. But this is what the wastewater signal looks like in Brockton now, showing definitely higher than it was a few weeks ago, indicating to me that case count is in fact going up. These are the actual measurements of uh, PCR testing on any given day. So uh, this is the so-called specimen date. So specimens obtained on this day, that's the actual number. And the actual specimen numbers, although they may underestimate it by three, five, seven times the number of cases, still looks like it's trending up over the past few weeks. Again, when you put it in perspective and look at the, uh, the past 365 days, even though things are going up, I just wanted to show you this to kind of compare it to where we were with the Omicron spike uh, last January. So there is a trend up, but nowhere near where it was uh, at the beginning of the year. That being said, it's certainly higher than that graph shows, even though the, the graph shows we're sort of close to 20 cases a day right now, we might be closer to 100 cases a day. PCR, the PCR uh, percentage positivity rate is released by the state each week. Uh, it's released on Wednesday evening, but it measures it through the previous Saturday. So this is only through last Saturday, July 9th. Tomorrow we'll know what it was through July 16th. Uh, and for the last two weeks it's gone up. And uh, my prediction is that it will probably be in the six, six to seven percent range when they release it tomorrow. It's important, though, that we look at the hospitalizations because this reflects the severity of illness. And as we have kind of heard through news media and uh, through releases of scientific papers, the BA5 variant, which is what we are seeing right now, doesn't seem to be causing as severe illness as the past variants of COVID. And, and whether this is related to the nature of the virus itself or the fact that so many people have gotten so many immunizations and have been infected and have natural immunity now, that there's some immunity in the community, and so uh, there's some protection against the BA5 variant. But this is the uh, hospitalizations a year ago today. There were two people in the hospital. Uh, today, uh, there's 14 
patients between the two hospitals, one in the ICU, which represents just under 5% of the hospital beds. We like to see it under 5%. And this is the death count uh, as of this evening. So 505 total residents have died for, throughout the course of the pandemic. Uh, none this past week, uh, but uh, uh, as we've seen in the past, usually case counts go up, followed by hospitalizations, followed by deaths. So uh, we'll keep our eye out and, and see what happens in the weeks to come. Uh, in case you're wondering who are the residents that have died in the city, this is the age profile. Uh, and as you can see, it really, uh, under the age of 40, very, very rare for someone under the age of 40 to die, even under the age 50 is uncommon. Uh, we're not alone, so everyone around us uh, is seeing the same kind of uh, spike. Uh, this is using, again, the Mass Department of Public Health color coding, looking at cases, case counts per 100,000 and percent positivity. Uh, and you can see that all of the towns have higher than 10 uh, cases per 100,000 per day, virtually all of them over 5%. The two exceptions are Avon and West Bridgewater, and only because they, 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 because they are municipalities of under 10,000, they play by a different rule. They have a different color coding system. They don't measure the case count per 100,000. They look at the actual 14-day case count, and that puts them in a little different group. This is uh, the most recent CDC community level. So if, uh, and the CDC releases this on Thursdays. Uh, so last Thursday, this is, we were considered medium. Again, they look at hospitalizations and amount of folks in the hospital. But quite honestly, if it were released today, uh, because the number of admissions, and I'm not sure I have a pointer, but the number of uh, admissions per 100,000 is 9.3, and last week was 10.3. Because it dropped below 10, that puts us in the low category. So this is kind of hovering. Some weeks it's going to be a little lower than 10, some weeks a little higher than 10, kind of bouncing back and forth, just kind of hovering at that cusp. So if we were going to go back to the old daily dashboard and, and, and bring it out of mothballs, this is what it would look like today. Uh, so as of today, uh, 31,257 cases as of uh, noon today uh, with um, a, an average daily case count of 20.6 per day. As I said, 14 patients in the hospitals and 245 patients in isolation uh, with that number really being a gross underestimate of, of where we are. So what about contact tracing? So this has kind of been the mainstay of uh, what we, the Board of Health has been doing throughout the pandemic, but that has kind of gone by the wayside. When the Omicron variant hit and they were overwhelmed by uh, cases, it really just were not able to keep up. Now we do do contact tracing, we do make phone calls, but mainly it's to provide resources, find out if people need PPE, find out if they need help, uh, and most importantly, to find out if they are eligible for some kind of therapy, such as Paxlovid, uh, and make sure that they uh, have access to get that medication as quickly as possible. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, everyone is now doing home testing, and by now, everyone should know that you've got three rounds of free tests available to you. So, if you haven't done it, do it. Uh, just if you've got a smartphone or a computer, go to covid.gov, type in your name and address, and within a, probably now a few days, but certainly within the week, you will get a bunch of free test kits in your mailbox. Uh, and uh, if you know somebody who doesn't have a computer or a smartphone, uh, type in their name and address too, and have them uh, get uh, a, a supply of, of COVID home tests. Everyone should have a supply. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you do test positive, it is so important. I know the, the uh, indication for taking Paxlovid is mild to moderate illness. So you test positive, you have mild to moderate illness, not severe illness like in the hospital, uh, and you're in a high-risk group. So high-risk group is not just over age 65. It's many, many other medical conditions, and you should kind of have a game plan and know if you are in a high-risk group. Uh, so if you do test positive, how can I get my Paxlovid right away. So the, the, uh, the package insert will say you can take this medicine in under 
uh, if you've uh, tested, developed symptoms or tested positive less than five days ago. But the reality is this is an antiviral medication. You want to take it now. So if you test positive at 10 o'clock, you want to take the medicine by noon. Uh, the sooner that you take it, the, quick, the better it does at preventing viral replication, preventing the illness from spreading. So, uh, and just anecdotally, my 97-year-old mom woke up on a Friday morning with, uh, with a congestion and a fever, tested positive at 10 o'clock in the morning. By 11 o'clock, she was taking her first dose of Paxlovid. Saturday, she was feeling fine. Sunday, she was back to normal. So I know it's one patient, one test, but it sort of made me a firm believer, and I've prescribed it many, many times now to folks and find that uh, other than the horrible taste it leaves in your mouth, uh, it really does a, f a very good job of preventing illness. Okay, so we are at the school committee, so let's talk about kids. Uh, and um, last time I was here, I can't believe it was January, these were the numbers from uh, seven months ago now. Um, and this is we are, where we are uh, through the weekend, uh, which is the last time we tallied up the pediatric doses. So a total of 6,558 kids, and I'm saying residents under the age of 18, uh, are either confirmed or probable cases. So a confirmed case is a PCR positive test. A probable case, which we're seeing more and more of now because some of them do get reported in, uh, which are the, anti the home antigen test kits. Those are considered probable tests. And as we know now, they're probably just as good as a PCR. So this is the total of the 6,500 uh, kids that have gotten COVID. Remarkably, on only 11 have ended up in the hospital. And thankfully, uh, no deaths reported. So this has been, uh, as far as the city of Brockton goes, have been fortunate, I think, just in terms of the severity of illness for the younger, uh, for the younger population. And this is just taking a look at, through the course of the pandemic, how many uh, pediatric patients, uh, residents under the age of 18, uh, have tested positive. These are both confirmed and probable uh, cases through last weekend. Uh, if we're looking at by, by school age kids, so we're looking at uh, pre-K, grade school, middle school, high school, this is the actual numbers uh, of students to date. And if you prefer looking at it by percentages, these are the percentages. And uh, I'll send this copy to the superintendent to the slide deck so all of you can have a copy of all of the, uh, all the slides. Boys and girls equally represented. Uh, and just a word about uh, vaccines, uh, you know, so it's not just Pfizer and Moderna anymore. Today, actually, the CDC uh, approved Novavax, a new vaccine uh, that uh, not quite yet on the market. It'll have to be officially approved by the CDC director, but usually that happens within a day or two. So we'll have a, a fourth uh, vaccine awaiting us. And of course, uh, you know, recently within the last a uh, month or so, uh, the vaccine has been approved for uh, kids over the age of six months. There are several pediatric practices and hopefully more to come uh, in the city that are offering the, the pediatric vaccine. So, and there's a list right there and we'll be contacting those that don't offer it to see if we can uh, help, help them make it available. So uh, both Pfizer and Moderna are available now for kids, and I'm not going to go over the, uh, the series, uh, but uh, it's just important to know. We are trying to make this as available as we can. Uh, Pinnacle Partners uh, is uh, offering a, a wide range of events, so every Saturday uh, in July and August at the mall, uh, you can get a vaccine no matter how old you are. If you get your first dose now, they'll give you a $100 gift card. Any dose, they'll give you a $25 gift card. So, uh, uh, you know, it's a good deal. Uh, Ash Street, uh, Ash Street, Bent Playground, uh, this Sunday, uh, we'll have an event with uh, uh, vaccines available. Uh, Brockton Public Library, Radical Reptiles, I think they're gonna have dinosaurs there. Uh, and uh, again, uh, lots of events available for kids to get vaccinated. So just if we look at our most recent data, 
now these are now released uh, on, on Wednesday with data from the previous Monday, so this is as of last Monday. Uh, if we look at the entire population, all 100,000 plus now, uh, we used to be at 70 percent, but now if we're looking at everybody, 61.8 percent uh, have actually completed the primary series, so the first and second dose of Pfizer and Moderna. But if we look at now, we have a whole big booster eligible population five years up. Uh, so 29.4% of the population has gotten a first booster. Lots of room for shots and arms here. And if we look at the uh, population who's eligible for a second booster, which is age 50, even more opportunity for improvement. We know that the shots work. They are not great at preventing illness. So it is possible that you get a shot and you'll test positive, but they work great at preventing serious illness and death. And so uh, the more shots you get, the more protection you have. There was just a recent article in uh, uh, just, just this week in the CDC's publication that looks at uh, two doses, three doses, and four doses, and there's incremental protection from serious illness based on the number of doses of, of uh, number of boosters that you've gotten. So. The, the message is get a booster, then get another booster. Uh, this is the age group of who's gotten their first and second booster in Brockton. You can see that the uh, older age groups are a little bit more motivated uh, to get their shots, and I can understand why, just because they're at such high risk of serious illness. Uh, and there's the number that have uh, gotten their second booster, still lots of room for improvement. I know that we had a uh, uh, vaccine clinic yesterday or the day before at the uh, senior center. So lots of, lots of opportunity still for uh, seniors to get a, another vaccine. Uh, this is what the school age kids look like now in terms of the vaccines they've gotten in terms of their primary series, meaning a first and second dose, and a first booster for those that are eligible. So uh, older kids doing a little bit better job than the younger kids. So for those of you who want to follow the data and are uh, more curious about seeing data updated more often than weekly, uh, I'm going to try and update the city's coronavirus web page as frequently as the data becomes available. So some of these slides that you saw just in terms of case counts, percentage positivity, hospitalization, death count, when I get those data, I'll try and update the, the city page so you don't have to wait for a full week uh, for the weekly dashboard to come out. But that's the update. That's what I've got. There's lots and lots I could go on for another five hours, but I know you have other business to get to, so that's the story. And I'm happy to take any questions if yeah, you have. No, thank, thank you, Dr. Herman, and uh, just, just point of information as well. We're still doing, uh, every Tuesday up at the Shaw Center, uh, our local Board of Health are doing shots up there, first shot, second shot, and boosters. And then on Saturdays, we're still a regional facility with the Department of Public Health. So Brewster is still uh, doing that every Saturday. And then every other week on Thursday, we're still doing local Board of Health at the Cape Verdean Association on Montello Street. The only nuance that Dr. Rick showed us, the 505 deaths, uh, was a lot higher because DPH used to count a death within 60 days of death if you had COVID in your system. It was a COVID death. They changed it to 30. So if you recall, uh, we were well over 505 before they transformed uh, and, and modified their count. Uh, any questions for Dr. Herman? Uh, Ms. Azak. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Um, I just have a couple of questions. So out of the positive cases, do we know how many were boosted, vaxxed, um, and how, ma how many were not vaccinated? Um, because a lot of the at-home testing, we don't have access to that information. And I'm just curious to see, you know, because I do know people that are boosted, I mean, they're vaxxed, double boosted, and they're still getting it, and it's severe. So with those numbers, um, I know everyone's different and the medical issues are different, but I'm just curious to see what's the percentage of those that are vaccinated that are still getting the virus and those that haven't been vaccinated? So uh, the answer is uh, that we know some data about breakthrough cases. So folks that have, have uh, had completed a primary series, this is what the state releases, those that have uh, had a primary series and then are either hospitalized or died. And so the state releases that number 
Well, it did release that number. They stopped doing it when they stopped when they when they uh, switched to this weekly thing. They discontinued several reports, including that one. But I have been following that in Brockton, and it kind of parallels the um, the state's numbers, almost really eerily to the like the hundredth of a decimal place. Uh, I just I don't have that uh, available, but we know that data, and I'll be happy to share it with you. Thank you, because I, I definitely am interested in that information, especially where we have September right around the corner, and we're going to be getting our students back in the schools, our our teachers back in the schools, and I just know it's every every other day I'm hearing somebody else has it and they're boosted and they're vaxxed, and everyone's reacting differently to the variant, but just so we can start taking extra precautions. Um, right. You know, so we're getting a little too relaxed out there. Um, some are and some aren't, but it's just, you're gonna get it. Um, you know, it just, no matter what we do, uh, you try to be cautious, but um, I think it's just gonna be here. We're gonna have to learn to live with the virus. It's not going anywhere. It's just gonna be like, you know, like the flu. Um, so the BA5 variant, I heard that that one is not showing up in a lot of the at-home testing. Have you heard something like that or? No, I have, okay. not, I have not heard that. Okay. I've heard just the opposite, that it is showing up, but, but there may be new information out there. I, 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 I don't know a lot. There's more that I don't know about COVID than I know about COVID okay. at this point. I mean, it changes so frequently. But just with regard to getting vaccinated, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the, the mindset, um, you know, I, I know is, well, why should I get vaccinated? I'm gonna get, it, it doesn't stop me from getting COVID. But the more people that get vaccinated, the more it prevents the serious illness and death. You know, so the more people that have some element of immunity, it helps the community prevent people dying and getting put in the ICU on a, a ventilator. Another uh, point I wanted to make is that, uh, you know, uh, there's been some chatter that I've heard is I don't want to get my kid vaccinated before going back to school because there's going to be a new vaccine that's more variant specific, so more kind of engineered against BA5. And that is true. There is, uh, there probably will be a couple of vaccines out there that are variant specific against BA, BA5 coming out this fall, this winter, hopefully this fall. But, <coughs> but getting a vaccine now won't prevent you from getting the new vaccine. Even if you got it this week, you know, you can get one again, I don't wanna say next week, but soon thereafter. Getting the vaccine now, the existing vaccine now, doesn't prevent you from getting a vaccine in the fall when the new round comes out. Okay, I mean, that does make sense. Um, and just curious if you know the answer, those that, have, those that have been vaccinated and they have their vaccination card, I mean, is there an expiration to them if, if they haven't been boosted and they have only had one vaccine? Um, or are they just like there's no expiration? Um, you go to places they're like, oh, show you the vac show us your vaccination card. No, there's no there's no there wouldn't be a there, there wouldn't be a uh, expiration on the vaccine card itself. In other words, if some place requires you to have a vaccine or a booster and you've had it, you've had it. Uh, there may be an expiration on the effectiveness of the vaccine. So in other words, once you've gotten a booster after five months, you know, the protection really starts to fall off fairly dramatically. So uh, that may be the case, but, but as far as having the documentation of your uh, vaccine, it, there's no expiration on that. Okay, yeah, I was just curious because someone had asked me and they needed it to travel. And I was like, oh, I have no clue if they expire. Um, so depending on how long ago they had their vaccination, I think it was back in like early last year or something. Yeah, so not that, not that I know of. Now, I don't know. There may be some destinations that require a vaccine within a certain period of time, just like some places require a you know PCR test or some kind of test within a certain period of time before travel. I just haven't heard of that. Sure. Thank you. No more questions. I do want to say when Dr. Rick was saying a lot of people know more about COVID than he does, I, I have to say that's wrong. DPH actually goes to Dr. Herman uh, and they actually replicated his dashboard. So I think you're being modest, but thank you. Um, we also do have every, every Monday, it used to be three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but we still do a Monday call at one o'clock with Dr. Rick, Dr. Ina Montes here from our Board of Health, Steve Hook from our BEMA, uh, all the hospitals, all the hospitals, including the VA, 
uh, also Neighborhood Health Center, High Point, and Father Bill's. And Rick was right. We just had a breakout of Father Bill's Mainspring over the weekend, and also High Point had a breakout as well. But they worked diligently with Board of Health. Kathy, uh, Mrs. Ayler's, I think you had a couple questions. I did. I just wanted to know what your recommendation is at this point on quarantining. Once you have, once you, I mean, it, I feel like at this point here, it doesn't matter whether you have one vaccination or you're double boosted. It's irrelevant. Once you're positive, you're positive. And then how should we really respond to that quarantining? Like, what's your recommendation? Okay, so just to, I just want to clarify, there is a difference between isolation and quarantine. So isolation means you've tested positive, you've got COVID. Okay, and now you go into uh, isolation. Quarantine means you've been exposed to COVID and you're staying away just to find and make sure you don't develop symptoms. So for isolation, uh, I think it's pretty clear <clears throat> that there's a five day isolation period recommended, definitely five days. Uh, then after five days, it gets a little iffy. Uh, so the CDC recommendation is that you can come out of isolation after five days if you're fever free for 24 hours and your symptoms are improving. Uh, but you still have to wear a mask for another five days. There are those that say you should test on day six, and if you're still positive, to isolate for another five days. So it really depends on how cautious you want to be, who you're going to be around, but um, uh, at least five days of strict isolation after you've tested positive. Okay, one more question. Sorry, so um, to your point about testing after the fifth day, isn't there also the possibility that it could still be in your system and you could test positive again and not be positive? There's, it's a false positive. I'm just curious because I've heard that as well too. Yeah, so what you're hearing about probably is uh, someone who's uh, got a PCR test uh, and uh, now they've been in isolation for 10 days and then a week later they do another PCR test, it's still positive, even though they feel fine and they have no symptoms. And the answer is yeah, that can happen and the test, the PCR test, can remain positive for up to several weeks, maybe longer, but I, I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be surprising, up to several weeks. And the reason for that is because uh, you have so-called non-replicating RNA. So it's, you got genetic material still in the bloodstream, mm -hmm. but not viruses that are replicating and causing illness. So the test, the PCR test is so sensitive that it's still picking up uh, the RNA, even though it's, you know, it's, uh, uh, the good kind. You know, even <laughs> though you're, you're fine. Yeah. The, the home antigen tests are not quite as sensitive, okay? okay? They're pretty good, at, you know, if you do have symptoms, they're pretty good at picking up, uh, you know, your antigens, but, um, but uh, not, not so, uh, not so um, good at picking up very, very tiny amounts. Okay, no, that totally answered my question. Thanks, Dr. Rick. Thank you. Any at the show, uh, Mr. Sullivan, please. Thank you for your presentation. Excellent. And I was hoping we didn't have to see you again, but here you are. My question is, the, uh, the COVID-19 test kits that we take home, do they expire? I they do. Yes, they do. And um, you have to be a little careful on this because there is an expiration date, and it's possible, maybe even likely, that if you look at it right now, your expiration date has already expired. But uh, virtually all of the kits have had an extension of their expiration date. And there is a website you can go to to find out exactly when that expiration is. Some of them are 30 days, 90 days, some up to a year longer. So the, the, um, the expiration dates have really been extended on those kits. So it in other words, if mine has expired, say today, I still have another year to go, I can still use it? I don't know if you have another 30 days or another year. It really depends on the kit. And there is a, the, you know, if you, if you sort of typed in, you know, if you, ha you have to do a little bit of homework on this. Um, and maybe we'll, you know. Put that up on the city site, we'll find it. Yeah, we can, we can figure that out yeah. for you. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, any additional questions? Well, Dr. Rick, as always, we, we thank you. I can't believe it was six months ago you were here last, but um, that was a very thorough, uh, deep dive. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks you all for having me. Appreciate thank it. Have a great night. See ya. We will, uh, we will move on. Um, under A is presentation of water, water, I'm sorry, water stations and it's the parent advisory. Um, you have the floor. Hello.
Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, my name is Allison perrin Drag. I'm with the American Heart Association. I do their policy work. Um, we've been working with both the Parent Advisory Committee as well as the Superintendent and Facilities Group as well on around water filling stations. Um, for those that don't know about the American Heart Association, um, we're the nation's oldest and largest voluntary organization dedicated to fighting heart disease and stroke, whose mission is to be a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. As part of that mission, we've been working around providing access to clean, safe drinking water to make sure that people have, you know, are able to live longer, healthier lives. In particular, we have focused around um, schools and making sure kids have access to that. Brockton has done a, a really great job of prioritizing that within their schools. We know that water plays an important role in maintaining a child's overall health. Drinking water supports children's muscles, joints, and tissues. It improves their digestive system, keeps them growing bodies hydrated. Adequate water intake can positively impact children's cognitive performance, particularly short-term memory, and drinking water can also improve children's visual attention and fine motor skills. Water intake needs, needs vary based on gender, age, physical activity levels, and other factors. A national study of more than 11,000 high school students found that those who drink less water tended to drink less milk, eat less fruits and vegetables, and drink more sugary beverages, eat more fast foods, and get less physical activity. Children who are from underserved backgrounds um, were least likely to drink tap water. Access to drinking waters in schools varies by region and by social economic char characteristics of the students. We know there are many public health benefits of expanding access to drinking water in public places, especially schools. We know that more than half of school-aged children are underhydrated and too many children routinely drink sugary beverages. That makes it harder for their minds and bodies to work well. We also know many adults also dehydrated and find it difficult to find sources of drinking water in their communities. We really want to find ways to help people hydrate in healthy ways by making the availability of safe and free drinking water at schools and in communities a priority. As I mentioned, we first started working with the Parent Advisory Council probably about a year ago. Um, Superintendent Thompson, Thomas and Facilities Ken Thompson. Um, we have a very simple policy that we'd love to bring forth to the school committee to really codify the amazing work that has been already happening in the Brockton schools. Um, they have provided for a number of years and put significant resources into making sure they have water bottle filling stations for students to go in there. Um, Ken can confirm this, but I think almost every school is covered and they continually are looking to make sure that they have more access to that. Um, I believe in your packet there's a very simple policy. It really gives an opportunity that if, you know, we have a new superintendent or new facilities that this, this continues, that this stays a priority whether you're putting in a new school um, or existing schools and that Brockton can really be recognized. You're, you're very much out in the forefront of doing this. It's been done for a number of years. Schools are starting to do this, <coughs> excuse me, because of COVID they found that water fountains are very germy <laughs> and nobody wants to use them. And so they've been working really hard to, you know, there's significant um, federal aid to put in water filling stations. But as I mentioned, Brockton has already been kind of ahead on that. So in your packet is that policy. Um, you know, I'd love any thoughts on that um, and to be able to bring that up probably in a, in a meeting uh, after this one. But I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any, um, any questions? Ms. Uh, Ms. Rivas Mendez, please. So I have a thought first. I love number four, regularly cleaned, like to have that maintained and be sanitary. Um, when we say what this policy on number six, when it says carry approved water bottles, uh, what do you mean by approved? So it doesn't, that, this policy is just a recommendation and draft, and that certainly can be changed. Um, there are some schools that always worry about what water bottles look like, so some schools have made sure that they're clear water bottles, so that's really up to Brockton and kind of what that language needs to be for water bottles. We just want to make sure that kids are able to bring the water bottles in and be able to fill them. Okay. Because if you have water filling stations and they don't have anywhere to put the water, that's really unhelpful. <laughs> So you probably already have something in place on that. So that doesn't, it need, doesn't need to say that exactly. This is just a sample okay. that we've used in other school districts. And then in regards to the policy and each of its like benchmarks or steps, I think it looks great. I think this would encourage a lot of students to drink water and even staff. Um, and like you mentioned, water is just important, not just for age groups, but even for us. Yeah, you know, I think the more accessible water is and the more, to be honest, people feel that it's clean, right? Like people don't like to go to the water fountain, they feel that it's cold, they're more likely to drink it. Kids nowadays are looking for kind of that water filling station. They're not looking for their, our traditional kind of bubblers. Any, 
Any additional questions, Cynthia? No, I didn't. Okay, okay. Um, do, you, do you know what a water bottle costs? Oh, you know, I think they range. There's so many now options yeah. where people get them for free. Most kids already have them. I would say they probably range from a dollar to five dollars for the most part. Um, I know, you know, there's been a number of schools where we've partnered to, you know, look for opportunities for sponsorship for that. Yeah, so if that's, that's something thinking. in yeah. terms of that Brockton's worried about that they want to make sure they give every, like every kid gets a water bottle with a logo and says, you know, we can certainly, you know, work with you to do that. I think we should at least look into that, right? I mean, that would only make sense. I mean, not everybody has the means to buy water bottles, and if we can subsidize that, we should do that. It's the right thing. Um, yeah, and there's also usually, like, especially in the cafeteria, like, cups available, yep. so people have that, you know, I mean, maybe Ken can answer kind of what's available for that, but certainly, you know, if that's, a, if you feel like the water bottles are a barrier, you know, I'm happy to take we that We should at least look and, into it. And work with you on, yeah. you know, if you need help that with would that. would be wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan, you had a question? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Allison. Uh, number five, where it's... The uh, filters and yep. We so, have bottle filling stations now. Are they filtered? They and are cooled as well. <laughs> they are, but I'll let Kenny answer that. It's usually built into the. Car. So the the, fil the filters are built into the unit. Um, they normally last a year. There's light indicators on each unit. It's green, amber, and red. When it turns red, we replace the filters and our custodians monitor them on a daily basis. So all our filling stations now have that already? Yes, they're, they're, oh. integral, they're integral to the station itself. All right, thank you. And just as a number, we've got about 140 stations installed already throughout the district. And we started that back in 2017. Uh, we opted into the state's uh, lead and water program and rather than wait uh, for the ultimate outcome when we saw what was coming in, it was then Superintendent Smith and Deputy Superintendent Thomas at the time said, let's move forward with it. So we started back in 2017 installing these. And they're basically in corridors, gymnasiums, and cafeterias. It, what about the cooling, Ken? Is that also? It's all in, it's in there. These, it's in the, there already? Yeah, these are electric powered units. Okay. So the cooling is in the, in the system itself. Okay. We're trying to make this as simple as possible. And, and I think there may be some schools that have actually supplied water as, as part of their uh, budget in their schools. Some of them have got the school logo on them. So that's certainly, Mr. Mayor, something we could look at across the district. Ken, what was, I still use the burb, word bubbler. Who uses the word bubbler? You guys all use it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know and, 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 and actually there's a bubbler component to the unit. Yep. But what, what is what each unit cost? Do you have a guesstimate sure, on that? No, so actually, right now, currently, the unit is $1,165 okay. to purchase the unit. Um, we keep the cost down because we do the electrical and the plumbing in-house ourselves. So that really keeps the cost down. There's districts. We've talked to some people in Boston where they go outside, and our cost is $1,800 a unit there in excess of $3,000. No, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Ms. Azak, followed by Mrs. Ehlers, please. Thank you. Actually, uh, Mr. Sullivan had asked my question because I do remember back in 2017 seeing them in the warehouse and, and knowing that you guys were installing them at a lot of the schools. So that's why I'm thinking we already have these. Um, so as far as cleaning them, they're not self-cleaning. The no, custodians. That, that's part of the custodian's normal routine. Okay. Uh, every custodian does that. Okay. I do. I, I have seen the students using them. Um, it's wonderful rather than using the bubbler. I do use that term myself. Um, so no perfect. I, I was gonna, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, we have these already, uh, but we don't have enough of them. We need more for the schools. Well, again, it's, there's 140 throughout the district, and I think in the recommendation it was 100 per, uh, per 100 students, which maybe would be 150, 160, depending on enrollment. So you know, we're continuing to put them in, but we put them strategically throughout the schools so they're easily accessible to the students. Okay. Um, and with the bubbles, just a note, what we did was when there was an issue with the bubbles, we bought caps for the bubbles that locked so the kids couldn't use the bubblers. The one out here in the hallway was even taken down, yeah. the cap, so thank you. Thank you. Some of the water pumps can be put, like the filling station, we put part of that bubbler, um, and so there could be both, but if you find like any lead in them, they tend to block the bubbler part because this is filtered. This policy is really, Brockton has already done this. This is really just to be able to codify what Brockton's already done and be able to really recognize you guys as, you know, what everyone else should be doing, honestly. Perfect. It should be very easy, I hope. <laughs> 
I'm good, thank oh, you. Oh, good, thank Mrs. Ayless. Um, honestly, I think you answered the question already because Ms. Azak had asked it, but basically I was gonna say, do we have enough? Is 140 enough stations? Or should we be, should we be adding more in certain schools? That's all. What, what we do is we, we've we continued to install them. Again, that's all yeah. starting in 2017. So we do put more in as, as the need arises. So we kind of look at where they are strategically located and we deal with the principals in the school and see what their concerns are. So we're certainly, willing and able uh, to install additional as we have to. Perfect, thank you so much. Ken, quick question on the new Champion High School, the old May Institute, we've already installed, have we? Yeah, we've already them? started installing there as well. Great, great, thank you. One, one last question. So do we have these over at the stadium where we do have a lot of the athletes? Um, you know, is it something that we could well, put there uh, for them? The, the athletic director has a water drinking system Station. that they okay. bring out. It, it's like for athletics, it's huge and it, like they fill their bottles up with it. So they've got that system on their own for the athletics. Okay, okay, thank you. Mr. Rodriguez, please. Quick question. Do each of these bubblers have a meter on them so you know exactly how much water that these students are actually drinking if it is being utilized? Yeah, there's a meter. Every time there's a fill, it registers so we can track how much it's being used because sometimes the filters don't last a year because some schools get more use out of them than others. like from that perspective that's what we really want to see right because then we know that ideally kids won't be drinking like the sugary beverages if they're having the water I mean that's kind of where the heart association comes in <laughs> why we care about this so Ken we we've, we've changed out at every gymnasium at every Brockton public school every gym has one of yes. these okay yeah. good in the cafeterias and all well. the calves and, yeah. okay any um any additional questions and I, I would just like to say that to, to Ken's earlier point that Brockton has really tried to figure out how to do this the most cost effective way. You know, when we tell schools that they should put these in, we, we say on average about, you know, 2,500 to 3,500. Brockton has done it significantly because of the amazing facilities that they have in place that they can do their own plumbing, they can install them. So some of the delays you look across the state that hasn't done this is because of the cost and the fact that they don't, there's a bit of a backlog because Brockton's been doing this for so long. Like when the pandemic hit, people couldn't order them, but Brockton had kind of had them in place and could do them. So I think it's a testament to kind of that you were well prepared ahead of time. So I'd just like to applaud the facilities for that and just point out that Brockton is doing it very cost effectively. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback on that, we, we so ahead of the curve, I was on a, a call with the MMA with all these different mayors and Department of Public Health, and they were talking about gateway communities dealing with lead. And when I spoke, they said, May, you already started that in 17. I mean, so we truly have been ahead of the curve. So. Thank yeah, and there's definitely, I mean, I will say now with the pandemic hitting um, between the treasurer's office that has a program, you know, MWRA does some lead testing. There is some federal funding where schools under kind of the ESSER funds could get money for this. Brockton was far, much further ahead on this. We've gotten a lot of people to kind of start to think about it because of the resources there. But I would just say I would really applaud Brockton for its, you know, innovative thinking way ahead of the, when I think people started to get really worried about the lead. Thank you. Yeah. So what is the next process? We should vet this out and then we should take a formal vote at, a, at another meeting? Yeah. Okay. And I'm happy to follow up and any questions and stuff. So, you know, anything that you guys need, but happy to support this, happy to get, you know, if the parent advisory wants to come and support that they've been really great. But, you know, I think honestly, this is just codifying what you already have. It should be easy. Um, I was just asking the deputy if she had any questions. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I think we're good. We're good at this time. Great. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Follow up, Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, just one quick question. It, you're saying the policy is already in place? No, now, the, policy, just, the policy is the one piece that isn't in place. I mean, the, the, what, but everything that's on this policy is already in place. So this is really just codifying what you guys are already doing. You know, us and we just like to see it in paper. <laughs> yeah, so what we'll do is we'll work with either Sarah or Peter um, Mello. Um, and then we'll be able to, at a, at a future date, we'll be able to ratify it. Yeah, and I can get back to your office around kind of if there's an opportunity for help on the water bottles. Sure, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll continue on the agenda. Um, B is, uh, i got to read my glasses. Items to refer to subcommittee. Are there any matters that are going to subcommittee at this time? Not that I'm aware of it. Do you, Mr. Sullivan? Just want the facilities we're trying to get a meeting set up for the facilities subcommittee. Okay. And it hasn't been done yet. Who's the chair? I am. Okay. 
All right. So that would happen in the near future? Yes, if you could. Yep. Do you want to try to set a date now? Yeah, if we could. Sure. Any any objections if we could just set set up a date? Yeah, I was actually going to ask the same That'd be question. wonderful. Met yet. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. I don't know off the top of my head know who the members of the facilities are, so. I'm not sure myself. I, okay. I, I know I'm the chair. Okay. I don't know okay. who else. I'm on there. Okay. Yeah. Kathy, you're on there as well? Yeah. Tony, you're on that? Okay. All right. You want to be on it, Kathy? <laughs> so, uh, so Judy's on. Okay, so uh, you're the chair. Will, will, will of the chair, whatever you want to set up. Yeah, well, what the, a lot of people wanted to see the new May Center, what was going on down there and yep. how it looks. And I know you were talking about the water bubblers and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, Deputy Superintendent Cobbs wanted to give us a walking tour, or he would give a tour first to the subcommittee um, just so we don't violate you know, with a form or anything like right, that. Right, right. So if you want to coordinate with Jim, I don't want to speak to him. I don't know his schedule, but I know he's ready, willing, and able to do that. What, what's the feeling of the committee? Joyce, Tony? What dates are, um, sorry. Um, if you want to give us some dates, and actually, I think where we're touring, where we're, even though we're a subcommittee and we're touring, I think we're fine because um, we are touring facilities. Um, so we should be okay as, as the four of us touring them. Um, I did that last time with one of the buildings that we had. We just all went at different times. Um, so I'm, whatever you want. Uh, do you want to have a meeting here, Mr. Sullivan? No. no and have facilities come here and discuss some of the different things that are going on or just go to the I May would, Center? I would just go to the May Center and then we could talk about it there to see what, if sure. there's any problems or questions. Sure. Um, sure, we'd have to just discuss with Dr. Cobbs. Um, see what he has. I mean, it'll have to be those that work um, either later in the afternoon or in the morning. It all depends on Mr. Rodriguez's schedule and Mrs. Sullivan's and mine and yours. So, um, I'm open. I'm open for anything, anytime. Sure. So, how do you feel as far as well, Mr. It probably have to be in the afternoon due to work schedules for a couple of us. So, but we, we can probably do that on the side rather than take it up during a school committee meeting. Maybe we can do it afterwards if you want. Well, the reason I asked is we, this was done about a month ago. Nothing ever happened. So I'm just trying to set it up. That's all. Sure. So if you want to pick a date, Mr. Sullivan. Um, How about July 23rd, this Friday? I think well, that's a little short notice. <laughs> I think um. I think that's with all, Saturday. With all, that's with all Saturday. due respect, I think you can give a tentative date, but you have to run it by Dr. Cobbs. I don't know his vacation schedule. It's in the middle of the summer, but um, I think it'd be nothing wrong with coming up with a tentative date, and then you can confirm with Jim. All right. Linda, do you know it? I'm sorry. I can send out an email to all the members, including Dr. Cobbs, and perfect. give you some tentative dates, and then that way they can decide and collect it together. Sounds good. That works perfect. Just, right. just so the record could reflect, um, Melinda, <coughs> Melinda Campbell will give some dates, speak to Dr. Cobbs, and then, and then book it. Okay, so it'll be booked via email, and then, and we'll be able to reflect that in the uh, in the next meeting. Sounds fine. Great. Thank and you. any other members of the committee that are not on facilities that want to do a tour, Dr. Cobbs is is able to do that as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Anything else, Mr. No. Rodriguez? No. Mr. Sullivan, nothing. Mr. Rodriguez, please. Uh, I would like to schedule. Uh, safety and transportation if we can have that prior to our school committee meeting in August um, If we can push back, I believe we it's scheduled for six if we can move the meeting to 7 p.m. the regular school committee meeting and have the subcommittee at six so we could bring in there uh, lieutenant Jones um, Dr. Murray and Everybody else on that side to give us a presentation where we are prior to open up to school, uh, school opening did we, did we, just reflect my memory, did we all take a, a vote to have summer at 6 o'clock as opposed to 7 for school yeah. committee? Yes, yes, we did. So yeah. we would just need to take another formal vote to honor Mr. Rodriguez's request because we've already voted on that. So you'd have to make that in the form of a motion, Tony, and then we can. Make a motion to move our August 23rd school. I, I apologize. I believe it's already on the agenda for August because I believe I discussed it with the superintendent 
Um, so I believe we were going to invite them, Mrs. Campbell. Okay. Um, but it would be nice to have it, um, since you are chair, to have it meet prior and then follow up during the meeting. Okay. So you, I apologize. But we would for still need to take a vote because didn't we? We didn't we collectively as a group say in the summer we'll meet at six as opposed to seven. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we need to take that vote to change that previous vote for that specific date in August to make it a 7 p.m. school committee meeting. We, we still would need to do that under Robert's rules, so we should. So you need a motion? We, I just have a question. Why are we changing the time? Tony's going to have a one hour um, subcommittee meeting, so the police can come in and give us updates. Before. Why can't we meet at 5, then, if the meeting's at 6 for the subcommittee? That's to give people ample time. Some people work till 5. To give the subcommittee time? So we can meet prior to us. We can to meet our regular also meeting. another date so that it's not affecting the time of the school committee meeting. We could also meet another date for. I make a motion to move our August 23rd regular school committee meeting from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. in order for us to conduct a public safety and transportation meeting at 6 p.m. Second. Form of a motion was made by Mr. Rodriguez. It was properly seconded by Ms. Azak. Uh, any comments on the motion? Um, I just have a comment. I think Cynthia. it makes sense the 23rd just because I think it makes sense the 23rd because if everybody's coming that day, if we would change the date, it's like asking them to come to different dates. Um, just a thought of convenience and, you know, if they're presenting in the school, we could vote that same day and see, like, prepare us for September because I think they would have better updates on the 23rd than versus the 9th or 16th. Just a thought. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Sullivan, followed by Ms. Azak, please. Um, the thing is, is that you, you can't keep changing the times of meetings. As a public body, it doesn't look good if you keep changing the times of meetings. We've already decided at 6, okay? We can always meet on another night for this subcommittee, another Tuesday. We already know that every Tuesdays we can those are school committee meetings, okay? We've already known as school committee members, we reserve a Tuesday night for school committee meetings. It doesn't look good if you keep, you say seven, the public doesn't know and they're already confused because a lot of the meetings are not starting on time. As a public body, it's our responsibility to be res respectable to the public. So I do not vote to change the time. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Sullivan. We haven't done the vote yet. There has been a motion. It was probably seconded, but on the on the motion, Ms. Azak. I actually agree with Mrs. Mendez. Those that are presenting that evening, we have presenters coming here to ask them to come twice to present the same material. We need to accommodate them as well because they're they're coming here on their own Thank time. You. Thank you. Chair's going to call the vote. Uh, all, all in favor of the motion, as stated. All opposed. Motion carries. We will now go on to uh, unfinished business, which is agenda item number five. Um, there's a few a few votes we have to take. Um, the first one is the BPS student parent handbooks for the year 2022-2023. Um, we've already vetted these out. Are, are there any questions or comments? And if not, we'll entertain a motion on uh, on approving it as stated. Is there a motion on the floor? Motion to accept BPS student parent handbooks 2022 to 2023. Motion was made by second. Uh, Mrs. Rivas Mendez, properly seconded by Mrs. Sullivan. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, that, that passes unanimous. Um, the next one is discussion and a potential vote relative to bid review subcommittee meeting, uh, which was tonight. And the chair, Mr. Sullivan, if you want to opine on that. Yes. The bid review subcommittee met tonight the meeting was supposed to start at 5 30. We, we waited to, for Tony Rodriguez. It started at 5 40. We had 100% in attendance. We have a lot of questions and a lot of false statements. Two motions were made, both come out in a stalemate. The meeting was adjourned at 5 45 p.m. Thank you. Wasn't there a motion to postpone? No. There wasn't a motion to postpone? No. Okay. That was that, I'm sorry. I'm so you sorry. Motion I... with the table. No, no, no. I was here. There wasn't a second on the table. There was no vote on the table. Right. Right. So then there was a motion to postpone. Correct. And it was passed. 
Oh, no, sitting right over there. Two. Huh? It was a two to two vote. Yes. Judy's correct. It was two to two. Two Don't saying yes to postpone well, and two well, saying nothing no. passed. All right, we'll move on then. Um, discussion and potential vote, and let me explain why this is, uh, regarding the Tuesday, October 4th, 2022 school committee meeting. That is Yom Kippur, uh, October 4th. So uh, we need to um, do a day change to the following Tuesday, which would be October 11th, 2022. And if we pass and do that, we would need to take the next vote, which would be changing it from Tuesday the 18th to the week after that, the 25th. Again, the Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur, is October 4th this year. So is there any uh, questions on, on the first one regarding the Tuesday, October 4th school committee meeting, take, change that date one week out to October 11th, 2022? I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Motion is to, to change the October 4th, 2022 school committee date to October 11th, 2022. Motion was made, is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, motion made by Mr. Sullivan, properly seconded by Ms. Sullivan. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, that passes unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, now relative to changing it from the 18th to the 25th, is there a motion? Motion to approve regarding the Tuesday, October 18th school committee meeting. Change the date to Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion was made by Mr. Homer. It was uh, initiated by Mr. Sullivan. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, it passes unanimous. Thank you very much. Just one question, Bob. Sure. Uh, the, I mean, Mr. Mayor, are these 7 o'clock, these two meetings? Uh, yes, the only six o'clock, I believe the vote was for the summer months and we'll go back to regular schedule 7 p.m. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, good question. Um, agenda six is, uh, is new business. Is there any new business before us tonight? Can I just say something? Sure, Deputy. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the graduation for Edison Academy yes. that yes. happened last week. Um, the mayor was the keynote speaker and gave a really encouraging speech and it was uh, Christina Dunavaish, the principals, that was her first graduation. And so uh, her message to her students about the importance of Edison and having a different pathway for older students, for students new to the country, for students who just need something different because they're working. Her message was really powerful and strong. And so 220 students graduated from Edison, 167 of them attended the graduation. So I wanted to acknowledge that and say great speech. Oh, thank you. And I want to thank Deputy Superintendent Sharon Waldo was there, Deputy <laughs> Superintendent um, Jim Cobbs was there, many of the school committee members was there as well. It was a, it was a great night. It was on Marciano Stadium. Um, and again, thank you for bringing that up, Deputy. Um, any, um, Ms. Azak, please. This is my yearly message. Um, so cradles to crayons, I know everybody loves this. Um, they're scheduled to be delivering 2,500 backpacks for me this year. So I just want to let some of the families know they will, we will have the backpacks. We're gonna try a different distribution this year to get them out to the families a lot sooner um, than, you know, and it's gonna be first come, first serve. So those that need them ahead of time, please reach out to me. I can try to pull them aside for you. Um, but they will be here the first week in August and we will need some volunteers to try to coordinate this and we're gonna probably be distributing them from Brockton High School. So I know there's a need out there. We have a lot of families that are always reaching out and I just want to thank Cradles to Crayons. I mean, they upped it to 500, 2,500. So they gave us an extra 500. In my seven years, we've had over 14,000 backpacks filled with school supplies for our students. So they take, we have such a great partnership with them. So I always want to acknowledge them, and I always say I want to do something special for them. But COVID kind of threw a little monkey wrench into that. But I'd love to invite them to our city and maybe have a little something for some of the members that, that I've been working with over the years. But Cradles to Crayons, we will have the backpacks. Reach out to me. You can always find me um, on social media or just reach out to Brockton uh, BPS and um, just give the information, and we will set them aside for you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other new business before us? If not, I'm going to entertain the final agenda item, which is a motion to adjourn. Is there someone who wants to make that motion? Motion, motion. to adjourn. Second. Okay. <laughs> this is Rivas Mendes made the motion. Probably second by Mr. Sullivan. All in favor? All opposed. Motion carries. Adjourned. Drive careful. Have a good night.